I know that we're staying in between you and lunch, um, but I'm really excited to be here today and um, I've, I've brought with me my friend uh, Maureen Stover and online we have the esteemed um, Dr. Van Dempsey. Thank, yes, good, good morning Van. Good morning, how's everybody? <laughs> We're doing great. Um, so I want to um, I want to start off uh, by doing a couple of things. So I'd like to introduce uh, myself and my background just a little bit, so you know kind of where I come from and what my passion is for this work. Um, prior, as the superintendent said, prior to this role, I um, I was working in Rutherford County Schools. I was a teacher there for about 17 years in uh, at RS Central High School, where I taught Dr. Kim Gold's daughter. Um, so we, um, you know, there's there's a lot of connection here in this room for many years. Um, uh, but before I was a high school English teacher, I spent many years trying to not become a classroom teacher. You see, my mother had been a teacher for over 30 years, and like many teachers in our profession, she told me that I could go to school to be anything I wanted to be except a teacher um, because she knew the challenges and hardships that teaching provided or that teaching caused uh, for her, and, uh, and she wanted something different for me. But um, during that time where I was trying to not become a teacher, I got my graduate degree from UNC Chapel Hill and became an adjunct professor. And then I moved to New York City where I became an adjunct professor at Rutgers University. And then I decided that I could become an adjunct professor at New York University. And then I moved back to North Carolina where I became an adjunct professor at Central Piedmont <laughs> Community College. So um, prior to coming to the K-12 classroom space, I spent many years um, in higher ed trying to not become a teacher. Um, until my mother said, I think this is your calling and maybe you should just give into it. <laughs> um, my mother was a teacher. Both of my brothers are teachers. Both of their wives are, are either are teachers or retired teachers. Um, my husband and my mother-in-law are former teachers. So I come from teaching. And so it was, it was no surprise to anyone that I too would become a teacher. Now I heard Dr. Gold say something this morning about how we oftentimes are you know, not identifying our students uh, as promising teachers. So I have twin daughters. They're 13 and they're in eighth grade at RS Middle School. Um, they have their first cheerleading football game tonight. Um, so I'll be zooming out of here after lunch and making sure that I make it there to see them um, with that. But um, both of them have high expectations for their lives. So, well, let me start with Mia. Mia wants to be a Broadway star or a dog walker, um, <laughs> whatever. Um, she'd be great at both. Um, Sophie, however, I think would be an excellent teacher. And I try to tell her that all the time. And I think outside of my friend, uh, Matt Bristow-Smith, I might be the only other educator who is encouraging her own child to become a teacher. And we are oftentimes stopping, we're, we're breaking our own pipeline by not encouraging our students and our own children to go into the profession that I love so much. Because there is no other profession that is any better than teaching. There is no other profession that is any better than education. Being a teacher is the best because then we get to teach all the rest. So with that, um, I thought I would just sort of give you a little bit of my background and, and why I think this work is so important. So I said I'm happy to have my friend Maureen Stover here with me today. She is the 2020 Burroughs Welcome Fund North Carolina Teacher of the Year and one of four finalists for National Teacher of the Year. What, what? <laughs> She is a um, former teacher from Cumberland County Schools and currently is a teacher with the North Carolina Virtual Public School System. Um, so she's able to teach online um, and NCVPS had it going 
before they they had virtual teaching going well before virtual teaching was an actual cool thing to do. So um, so she, we're happy to have her here today, and I'm also happy to be joined virtually, as I said, by Dr. Van Dempsey, who is the dean of the Watson College of Education at UNC Wilmington and one of my um, heroes in education. So I'm just really excited to have him here um, virtually with us, and um, he is also as of this week the new chair of Pepsi. Uh, welcome, Dr. Dempsey. Good morning. So I thought that I would go through a couple of things uh, for those of you who might not be uh, well versed on how we got to this point. So the, pro the Professional Pathways Project has origins many years ago where the, so the Southern Regional Education board, also known, and we're going to call it that from here on out, as SREB, um, created roundtable convenings in, I think, four different states, North Carolina being one of them, where they brought um, some ideas around licensure reform uh, to a, a group of stakeholders and started to really dig into what some of the issues were and what they thought might be some of the solutions. From there, um, they created the, the North Carolina Education Human Capital Roundtable. Um, and we'll just call it the, hum the Roundtable. So the Human Capital Roundtable took some of those ideas and began to grapple with those. Um, they presented their ideas to a group of stakeholders. They brought in people. I came in twice to two different meetings. I know Van um, came into one. I think there are several other people who were here who came in to some listening sessions to give some feedback um, on the things that they were discussing and what some possible um, iterations might be if they were to move forward. And they um, presented to the North Carolina State Board of Education um, uh, some information that they were coming up with. And so the state board charged Pepsi to draft a model. Um, and so that model became known as the North Carolina Pathways to Excellence in Teaching Profession. And that, um, that happened around March of 2021. Pepsi then was supposed to have subcommittee meetings that went from March of 2021 through December of 2021. But they didn't think that the work was done and they weren't ready to turn it over. So they decided that they would extend their subcommittee meetings for many months. Many months that lasted until this past month in August, where they finally um, and somewhat begrudgingly stopped having their <laughs> meetings because I think there were some people who felt like there was still work to be done, and there still is. Um, so um, starting um, tomorrow, we're going to see what the Pepsi subcommittee chairs have presented to Pepsi, and um, we'll be able to see what the new model looks like. Um, and they will then continue that work um, for for a few months at least. So you're, you're familiar with, um, with this model, what this looked like. This um, was the first iteration of what this might look like. I grabbed this from some of Van's notes so it has some of his highlights on it. Um, but you have a copy of it in your folder as well. Um, and they took that model and they created four subcommittees. So the four subcommittees that met monthly were licensure, budget and compensation, advancement and development, and preparation and entry. And it was all supported through some DPI staff, a few of, of whom are in the room today. From that, um, those subcommittees were made up of over 100 individuals from all across the state from a variety of different areas. So um, the P-12 schools and districts that consisted of teachers, principals, and district leadership, um, public and private colleges and universities and community colleges, government agencies, and um, educational uh, other educational organizations. So all of those people met monthly, um, sometimes more than monthly, um, to really grapple with the, the ideas around licensure and compensation. 
You can see on this slide and the next some of the things that they were looking to do, like really determine some of the measures, trying to understand what some of the levels might be, how that compensation might work, um, and really what some of the advancement might be through throughout these different committees. And they were tasked with writing what this might look like. So what's next? Well, in September and October, if all goes well, um, Pepsi will will come will grapple with some of these things and, and put forth their their considerations, and then it will likely go to the State Board of Education in November or December, where they too might be able to ask questions and change the model um, and be able to come up with some new things. And then from there, it might go to the General Assembly um, for their long session. So as you can see, there's still several more steps before it even gets to the General Assembly. And during that time, we'll continue to have some ongoing stakeholder feedback. So there are several ways that you can engage in that feedback. Number one, you can send your feedback to um, this, uh, this email address. So it's pathways.feedback at dpi.nc.gov. You can also, if you're going to be participating or coming to the AIM conference, um, which is our DPI conference at the end of October, we'll be having some feedback sessions and inf information sessions there. Um, that'll be at the Raleigh Convention Center the last week of October. We'll also be having and holding some convenings around the state as we started to do uh, in the late spring and early summer with teachers, principals, and superintendents. And then we'll also have some external stakeholder feedback and I know that we have some colleagues in the room like um, the public school forum and others who have been holding some of those convenings um, and I'm sure that we'll have folks who are continuing to do that so I say all of that to really give you a sense of where it started and where it's going but it's certainly not work that's finished um, and there certainly is nothing that is etched in stone I think I can probably safely say that um, that really the only non-negotiables that we're looking at um, or, or that Pepsi is looking at are three things. Number one, they were charged by the state board to come up with a possible plan. Number two, that plan needed to have impact on students. And number three, that plan needed to be measurable in an authentic setting. And that's it. So. Let's start with some questions that I have for uh, my two panelists, and then we'll open it up, and I'm sure you all have lots of other questions. So let's start um, with Dr. Dempsey. Um, Dr. Dempsey, could you talk to us about why North Carolina should be doing this work right now and why you see um, this work as important? Sure, thank you, and good morning, everybody. I apologize for not being there in person. I outran COVID for two and a half years, and it caught me this week. Um, so I'm disappointed I can't be there, but you should be very happy I'm not. Um, <laughs> it's good to be part of the part of the group virtually. Um, I'm, Julie, I'll talk about that in three ways, and I'll try to be quick. One was prior to the uh, work that Pepsi took on in the spring of 21, some concerns and thoughts I started to have in different stakeholder groups that I, where I get to participate as a dean. Um, the second is uh, what I saw as an opportunity in this when it came before Pepsi. And the third is just make some quick comments about what it means to have a teaching profession in North Carolina. So in the stakeholder groups in, in the late part of 2020, some of the themes that I was hearing as I went to different meetings was uh, colleges of education weren't recruiting hard enough or districts weren't hiring fast enough or there were factors that were in play that we weren't uh, pushing hard enough across the profession. And I yeah, got, got frustrated as a dean because I knew we were working really hard to recruit and bring people into the profession and retain people once we got them there. Uh, the two things that I wasn't hearing much about in those conversations in late 19, in late 2020 were we weren't talking about teaching in terms of being situated in market forces or the profession in general being situated in market forces. I'm not a person who typically has used that kind of language in my career, but as we were looking at what had happened to the, to the education profession and teaching in particular over multiple decades in North Carolina, 
we were making it increasingly less incentivized to become a teacher, to create a market, in essence, where people wanted to become teachers and become educators, and then making sure that we were creating cultures within the organizations teachers are in to support them and sustain them. And that was happening at the same time that North Carolina was rightfully celebrating success in the business world and in our economic uh, opportunity. We were doing very well in, as a state in those kind of factors in our economy, but we weren't translating that into understanding the teaching profession being situated in the same way. So when this work came before Pepsi, after the state board saw it in early 2021, um, what caught my attention as, as potential opportunities with this were really about what did we, could we find in the work that we were going to do with the subcommittees, a way to create an infrastructure that would create those kinds of opportunities for the teaching profession. Could we focus on salaries and compensation and what a more healthy uh, structure for that might look like in North Carolina? Could we find ways to create sustainable salary increases over time that we weren't living in year to year salary adjustments uh, that were becoming unpredictable and in some cases didn't happen at all? Could we ensure that we had an architecture for professional status? Uh, how teachers were identified within the profession, new teachers, teachers in uh, pre-service folks in preparation programs, people who were career teachers who had gained knowledge and capacity through their experience and how we translated that into different roles. And what we were missing was a systemic approach to doing that. And North Carolina was really an abandoned approach. We were starting to put fixes on the structure rather than uh, really rethink the structure in fundamental ways. And that that's what I thought at the time this presented for, um, for the profession through the work that Pepsi ultimately would do. A few of the elements of the profession that um, I think are important to this work, and I think they undergird the conversations we've had in the subcommittees, as well as you can see in the feedback that we've gotten from teachers and other uh, stakeholders in terms of their responses and their reactions. Number one, having well-designed entry points into the profession. Number two, recognizing the importance and the power of teacher autonomy. Number three, understanding the importance of collegial and expert analysis of practice and how we use that to learn from practice so more educators can benefit from that learning. How do we basically transport that knowledge base through preparation programs and professional learning? Um, the next one, how do we make sure we build a professional learning model, go back to what the state superintendent said a few minutes ago, a professional learning model that is built on professional expertise. And that professional expertise and model sit within the work of teachers. It is situated in the practice. And how do we honor that and take advantage of that? How do we build an understanding of teacher practice on multiple forms of evidence? How do we have multiple ways of in sophisticated strategies understand the complexity of teacher practice and what it looks like when we see the kind of outcomes for student learning that we want in North Carolina? How do we make sure we have intentional support that's tied to a structure for professional learning? And how do we make sure we have a compensation model for teachers that is predictable long-term multi-layered and a person can look out over their career and see what that compensation model is going to look like as they grow, gain more experience and potentially change roles as a teacher. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I think it's really, um, really important to, to point out um, that this work and the people who have been doing this work really do have um, elevating the profession of teaching as a profession um, and really changing the way that that people both on the inside and the outside see their value as professionals uh, at heart for the work that they're doing. But also that that work um, of really elevating the profession and elevating that professionalism also has at its very core the very important thing that oftentimes gets left out of some of the conversation is its impact on children. 
that our children really are at the heart of what we're doing. And when we, as educators, feel valued, then we can really instill that value and that success in our children who are in our classrooms. So thank you. Um, Maureen, what do you think are some of the key strengths to the plan as you've seen it grow and develop throughout the committee work? Yeah, thanks for the question, Julie. So, um, you know, at the beginning when Julie introduced me, she introduced me as a Teacher of the Year. And I, I am very proud of that title. I, I think I'm very honored that I was selected for that. But most importantly, and the title that I have always been most proud of and the way that I always introduce myself is as a high school science teacher. That is who I am at my core. And children in our classrooms are very, very important. And as Julie just said, what a lot of times gets left out of the conversation is how learning is impacting kids. Those 1.5 million kids that are in North Carolina's public school classrooms are the future of our state. They are our state's treasure. And when we prioritize them in their public education and we find ways to make education work for each of them, design educational systems around our students first, keep them at the center of every conversation that we have, we will not go wrong in educating the kids in our state. And that means that we are improving the opportunities for our state because when our students graduate, from our TK-12 systems, they are ready to go to seize whatever their best post-secondary life is. And so I kind of started from that viewpoint as I walked into this work. And I knew that I was representing teachers and I was also representing those kids when I sat at the table. And so I, in every conversation I had, I really tried to prioritize what is best for teachers, what is best for kids. One of the major strengths I see of this plan is that we would significantly increase compensation for teachers. And that is a huge gain for our state because that means teachers will now have the tools that they need because they will have the money in their pocket to really be able to focus on educating children. And that is really, really important. For a lot of teachers, this could potentially mean an increase of about $20,000 a year in the amount of money that they're making. And that is a significant increase for teachers in our state to be able to have that compensation. Another really incredible thing is that we would be designing tools that would help teachers identify exactly where their kids are in their learning. So teachers would be able to pinpoint where students are and what students need. But we wouldn't just leave them with those tools. There would also be adult leadership teachers who would come in and help them understand how to use those tools, how to analyze the data, how to find new ways to be able to reach students so that they are able to reach every single student in their classroom and meet the diverse leads, needs of every single student that's sitting in their classrooms. And that's, that's a monumental change. It revolutionizes, and I actually heard someone say the other day that they don't really want to use the word revolutionize because in revolutionize, somebody wins or loses. So evolutionizes the way that we are educating children. And we could be a national leader in that. If we are able to make this work in our state, we have an opportunity to lead for other states. How do we make this work? How do we show other states how we can prioritize children, prioritize educators, find a way to grow our educators and give educators opportunities to stay in the classroom impacting children every day, but also be able to lead and grow in their profession and continuously look for ways to improve our profession. The other thing I think is really important about this is the way that it would be designed by having the classroom excellence teachers and the adult leadership teachers taking active roles in growing the profession means that we would be using the expertise of the people who know how classroom teaching works the best, teachers. Those teachers would be partnering with our educational preparation partners and we would then be able to take teachers' expertise and redesign educational systems, prioritize kids in our classrooms, using the experts who are best in the field, and that is the TK-12 educational professionals. Thank you. I'd like to point out that that clap was initiated by Representative Torbett. <laughs> I'll be holding you to that. Um, so, um, yeah, I want to point out a couple things that really stood out to me during, during this time. Um, number one, um, and, and the superintendent has said this to me sometimes at, or in the past, that as a classroom teacher, 
our students come into our lives for a moment. We see them for a snapshot of their lives. And those, you know, they are going to go on and have snapshots with many other teachers. And those teachers don't necessarily have to be classroom teachers, right? Because we are constantly learning as individuals. Um, but how great and important and honorable is it to be able to affect some change for that student when he or she is in our classroom for that snapshot? Um, I also think it's important to point out, Maureen, that this model really does um, um, honor what teachers do on a daily basis, and that is they perform reflective practice. Mm -hmm. There's not a day that I came home from teaching that I didn't think back on what happened in the classroom. What did I do well? Or what did I really fail at? And one of the things that my students, um, you could probably ask any number of my students, I would fail at a lot in class. And oftentimes I think it's great for our students to see us fail and recover from that than it is to see us perfect all the time. So that reflective practice is really important and it's ingrained into this. And I think the other thing is that money oftentimes equals safety. Mm -hmm. And I love to think of the, um, really what that, that idea of what is our base level of needs as a human being. And safety is one of those base levels. And if you don't have money to be able to support yourself or support your children or support your family by the profession that you have cho chosen, then that safety can sometimes leave. And if you don't feel safe as a human being, how are you supposed to create a safe environment for your students? Um, so, so, you know, we're, as teachers, we're charged to do so many things. We're charged to make sure our students are safe, that they're fed, that they're clothed, that they're in a good mind frame, that they're going to be able to behave in class, that they're going to become good citizens, that they have opportunities to excel and advance, to have um, extracurricular activities, that they're going home to a safe home, that they have transportation, that they're going to have all of the opportunities once they leave our classrooms. And then on top of all of that, we're also charged to teach them. Mm -hmm. So why not pay teachers for the additional duties that they are already doing? And this model has that baked in as well. It right? does. It absolutely does. Um, so uh, I have a question for both of the panelists, and I'll offer it, and, and uh, maybe Dr. Dempsey, you, if you'd like to start us. Um, this afternoon, a lot of folks in our audience are going to be joining breakout sessions that focus on key parts of this plan. So in advance of those conversations, what's the one or two thing that you want them to really know about or reflect on? Uh, this proposed plan. Thank you, Julie. Um, the, one is to, as the plan is being discussed in the public space that is now Pepsi, to uh, look at the plan, look at the draft, um, you know, tr understand the different components of it. It's multi-layered, um, and uh, at each piece you look at, each of the licensure level, you'll see. Um, uh, different aspects of apprentice through license one, two, three, up into the advanced roles and, and, and study the plan. Uh, number two, if you have feedback, and we certainly hope, Pepsi hopes that you will provide it if you do, uh, number one, provide your response and your feedback, but number two, think about it in terms of recommendation language. So what would you want to see in the plan that Pepsi can consider now that we're going to be deliberating it in Pepsi. So one is understand the plan, and two is articulate uh, recommendations to us that that we we will certainly look at. Use the um, inf use the uh, access strategies that Julie shared earlier in the session. Great. Maureen? Um, so I think one thing, and this kind of follows with Superintendent Truitt and then also Dr. Dempsey's um, comments, is that this is still a work in progress. This has not been all figured out yet. We are still working on it actively. And I think it's really important to understand that when you hear the conversations happening or when we're talking through things, that's we're trying to figure out the best solution, right? Um, I know, although I do as much research as I possibly can and I try to come up with as many ideas as I can and I try to read as much feedback as I can, 
that when I walk into those meetings, the ideas that I have are not the best solution. The other people who are in those conversations also have ideas, and the best solution exists somewhere between all of our ideas coming together in collaboration. So when you hear someone who has an idea that differs from yours, just like the dress that Brenda showed earlier, remember that it might be coming from a different perspective. It might be coming from a different viewpoint. It's coming from different experiences. But when we engage in those conversations and we have authentic conversations, and sometimes those conversations are hard because sometimes you're really challenged to think about how you would view things or how I view things or how I think education should work versus how somebody else's experience has been and how they think it should work. We need to have those conversations and we need to be coming to the table willing to have those conversations to find the space in the middle that is the best solution for the kids in our classrooms and for the teachers who teach them. And I firmly believe that we have the right people in our state in those conversations to find those solutions. But we all need to be open and willing to be vulnerable and to sometimes hear that our idea is not what everybody else thinks is the best solution. And that's okay because part of our conversation will lead to the best solution. Um, I think it's really important to think about as you're moving forward and, 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 um, and having these conversations this afternoon is that, um, and, and Chair Davis said this uh, earlier uh, in one of the things that he said is this, we really want the best plan. The State Board has charged Pepsi with coming up with a plan and we want it to be the best. And we want to send it to the State Board. We want, we want Pepsi to send it to the State, I am not a part of Pepsi, the, the proverbial we. Um, so uh, we want Pepsi to send the best plan to the State Board. We want the State Board to be able to really grapple and ask the good questions and send the best plan to the General Assembly. And we want the General Assembly to look at this plan and say, yes, we can buy into this because yes, our students deserve the best and our teachers can be the best through this plan. And so um, all the feedback that we've, that, that we've been receiving, um, that Pepsi members have received, that the superintendent um, and the state board has received, have lots of ideas, but I think a lot of people feel chained by the past. What are the innovative ways that we could really make this the best plan? What, what kinds of ideas where there, there is no limitation could you really bring to this plan so that you could help us make this the best plan? Because not only do our teachers deserve it, but our students deserve the best. So I think I'm going to open up the floor for some questions, and we're here for all the juicy ones. Oh, I see one right here. Hello, Leah Rackley from Profound Gentlemen. Um, my question to you all is, we're talking about the pathways conversation. My lens is from teachers of color. So we look at the research, we talk about the reason why they leave, it's because of one, oppressive spaces. So what are the conversations that you all having around how are we preparing schools <laughs> to capture um, teachers of color or potential teachers of color? How are those spaces being created to make sure that they are non-oppressive when um, they come into the field? Sure. Um, I'm happy to take that one. Okay, so I think that's a real opportunity for us to have a really great collaboration between the, the higher ed schools and our K-12 schools. Um, where we can train teachers in anti-racist teaching practices, where we can help teachers understand what it means to feel oppressed and why spaces do not feel safe. And I think it also goes back again to having those conversations and being open and understanding when someone tells you that they feel unsafe or when someone tells you that you make them feel uncomfortable, that you are open to that and that you understand that and that you as a practitioner change your behavior so that you are, you're making people feel included and you're making people feel safe. Um, I think it's also really important that you're very reflective. As Julie said, we're reflective as practitioners in our teaching practice. We also need to be reflective as practitioners in the way that we are treating others around us and ensuring that we are providing safe spaces for them to feel like they are able to come into that area and they're able to feel safe and they're, that they are valued and they are respected and that they are seen. Julie, can I add something to that? Absolutely. Um, and it, it's a great question. 
Um, I missed most of the previous panel. One, one part of this work with Pepsi that's critical is how it intersects with the work that's coming out of the Drive Task Force. And I'm ex we're doing some of this work down at UNC Wilmington and in the Southeast region now, but as we create teachers of color networks, we, we create affinity groups of educators um, who, who bring that knowledge base, bring that experience, bring that uh, pedagogical skill set to how we prepare and how we support teachers in our classrooms. A couple of ways that this can be this work can be elevated through the work that uh, Pepsi is doing in the recommendations is number one, how do we recognize that pedagogical knowledge base that the questions suggest? There is expertise, there's capacity, there's a sophisticated form of teacher practice that is in that work that teachers of color do whether it's with children of color or with white students, and we've not made that knowledge base as explicit as it needs to be, both in preparation and in professional learning. And a great way to make that more explicit is to build it into the classroom expertise models in the advanced teacher roles. How do we make sure we're making that knowledge base uh, explicit in ways that we can share it within the profession? I think this, potentially the structure is there with the recommendations uh, we're looking at in Pepsi. And I, I think we'll harken back to something that Dr. Graham said in the previous panel about how um, EPPs can change some of the structure uh, when they're preparing their students um, so that they are really looking at the lived experiences of the students that they not only have now, but the possible students that they could have in the future to really build that pipeline to be more robust, more diverse, and more inviting um, and breaking down some of those barriers. And the other thing that Dr. Graham said that I, I think is um, we need to, to really keep in mind is that this is not necessarily just about partnership and it's not necessarily just about collaboration, but it really is about building alliances. And that I loved when he said that that alliance runs so much deeper than just a partnership or a collaboration, but that we are all moving together. And, um, and this work that Pepsi is taking up, it is definitely in alignment with the recommendations from the Drive Task Force, with the recommendations and the roadmap that the Leandro Comprehensive Remedial Plan has with um, the alignment that the Operation Polaris has with the Human Capital Working Group, uh, with the State Board Strategic Plan, and really making sure that there's opportunity and access, not just for our students, but for our educators too. Another question? Come on, y'all. This is like the juiciest part of the day. Where are those? Yes. Uh, you've got a mic coming to you. Oh, I do? Oh, yes. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, so can you guys speak to um, varying measures of teacher effectiveness and uh, other than the objective um, test scores that uh, Dr. Springer made reference to earlier today? That'd be great. Yeah, and I think that's a really key component of um, the proposal is that it would give teachers a choice in how they're demonstrating their effectiveness. So we know as practitioners that one test one day does not tell the story of our, us as teachers. We know that it also does not tell the story of our students as learners. And so by, by making different tools and designing different metrics that enable teachers to demonstrate the way that they are effective practitioners in different ways means that we're differentiating effectiveness just like we differentiate learning for our students. So just as our students will all learn in a different way and just as we all learn in a different way, each one of us would demonstrate that we are effective in our job in a different way too. So the Pathways to Excellence model will provide multiple choices for teachers to be able to demonstrate that they are effective with their students. Test scores would remain because we, we are federally mandated to give the standardized tests. We should leave those in there for teachers to have the choice to continue using the test scores if they choose to do that. But in addition to that, there would also be opportunities for teachers to use things from their curricular materials that are standards aligned and that would, they would then be able to demonstrate continuous improvement in their students from day one to day 180. And what that means is, is a student better on the last day of school than they were on the first day of school because I was their teacher? And the answer is often yes, Almost right? always yes, yes right? <laughs> So mm -hmm. let's, let's look at our students, and then that also helps our students know that they're successful, right? Because when your teacher says to you, high five, you did it, you're, you're doing awesome, you're doing great, that's reflective of that teacher doing great work with that student, right? 
And so it helps our students also realize their success in school. And so it's, it's going to give us the opportunity to really kind of fully develop the way that we are demonstrating that our students are effective in their learning and how they're being supported by their teachers. But in addition to that, we're not just going to say to a teacher, if you're struggling to be effective with students, we're not going to say, oh, you know, too bad. You're going to have this adult leadership teacher who's going to come into your classroom and work closely with you to help you be more effective. So this is truly a collaborative effort where we're going to take teachers from the adult leadership role who will transfer from working mostly with students to working mostly with adults. They will still be in classrooms every day. They will still be around students every day, but they're going to transition from working one-on-one -on -one with students to working with the adults that are helping the students learn. And they're going to come into those classrooms, help those teachers understand how to analyze data, how to figure out where students are in their learning, how to then use different strategies and methods to reach the diverse learning needs of all the students in their classrooms. And then if that strategy and method doesn't work, there will be follow-up where they will come in and let's try something different. So it's going to be continuously looking at where kids are. It will not just be looking at students on one test, one day, 65 questions. It's going to be looking at where was the kid on day one, where is that same student on day 180, and what did that teacher and what did this team at that school with the adult leadership, classroom excellence, and classroom teacher, what did they all do to fully support that student in their learning, academically, socially, and emotionally, to make sure that that student reached their maximum potential and is successful as they exit that grade level and go to their next classroom teacher. And I think we heard that with Chad in his video earlier, who's a mm -hmm. part of your, your team. Chad was a part of my um, team. Also from right next door to Rutherford County. So, <laughs> um, so we, uh, we, we heard that from him, that, that if he could have been um, looked at as a teacher and his effectiveness uh, in a different way, then, then he would have certainly been able to have remained in his job mm -hmm. um, throughout that work and, and to have uh, succeeded at being that excellent teacher from the get-go. And that's exactly what we want with our students too. So practicing what we preach, I think. Um, so I think uh, we'll be around uh, throughout lunch and this afternoon and would love to be able to take other questions. Um, I know that Dr. Dempsey will not be here face to face, but I'm happy to take your questions for him and to shepherd them over um, and be able to get you some feedback. But the best thing that you can do right now is to make sure that if you have ideas or you have comments is to shoot them to that email address so that we can make sure that we um, can get them to the right folks. So I am going to now thank you all for being such a wonderful audience. Um, thank my panelists, Dr. Dempsey and Maureen Stover. Let's give them a round of applause. Thank you, everybody.